It's Friday of Champ Week, and bubble teams are moving all over the place, including the North Carolina Tar Heels making history in a bad way. You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, welcome in to the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, the only daily national college hoop show out there. We are your hosts, he's Andy Patton, I'm Isaac Shade, and boy, we are less than three, like this weekend, Andy is selection. I'm just, I'm giddy with excitement, I'm like bouncing up and down here on the video. (laughs) (laughs) Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of the Locked On Network. Make every moment more, visit fanduel.com slash locked on today to get started. Listen, there's a lot more coaching movement going on. We had some yesterday. Uh, Since then, we've learned Patrick Ewing out at Georgetown. Mark Fox is out at Cal. Um, And obviously, we need to talk about this whole coaching carousel, and we'll do that in more detail in the days and weeks ahead. But right now, it's Champ Week, and we got a lot more stuff to talk about, part of which will be the Kansas Jayhawks, who... Uh, we, we bring them up not because of anything uh, related to games, but actually because Coach Bill Self, it, we found out, is going to miss the entire Big 12 tournament uh, with some type of medical issue. Kansas released a statement about it on Thursday. We do know that it's not a heart attack, but by them saying that, we know that it is something major enough to mm-hmm. keep them out. And so uh, our, our best to Coach yeah. Self as he recovers from whatever's going on. So, Andy, here's where we're headed today. We got some teams peaking at just the right time. We're going to talk about who that is, but we've got a whole host of bubble winners and bubble losers. And we got to start with the losers today because one of those is the North Carolina Tar Heels. And keep in mind, part of the reason we want to start here is because, frankly, there have been no bid thieves yet. Usually by this point, we've got one or two pretty clean sailing waters. And on top of that, all, all of the major Power Six conferences are pretty chalky right now. We, we haven't seen the top four seeds in the Big Ten or SEC yet. We'll get them on Friday. But the ACC semifinals tonight, top four seeds, all chalk. Big East semifinals, top four seeds, all chalk. Big 12, the top two seeds are playing teams five and six. Pac-12, teams one, two, and four are still left. And only um, team team three is out. That's USC. So yeah. that's one of the big storylines is all this chalkiness. But that's why we start on the bubble with the losers. And the first one is the preseason AP number one team, North Carolina, who loses to Virginia on Thursday night, 68 to 59, with a, as we talked about, a limited and hobbled and frankly ineffective Armando Baycott. Yeah. So Carolina drops to the first four out, or the next four out, I should say, on the bubble. And here's the storyline, Andy, the, the bigger view storyline. North Carolina dropped out of the AP rankings in week five, the earliest preseason AP. <laughs> one to ever do so at least in the 25 team era the only team in the entire history of the ap poll to fall out earlier was ucla who fell out in the fourth poll of the 1966-67 season but that was when only 10 teams were ranked so north carolina making history in an inglorious way but the reason i bring that up is because now they're going to become the only 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 that means one preseason <laughs> AP number one to ever miss the NCAA tournament since it expanded to 64 teams back in 1985. Andy, this is a bad look for a team that two seasons ago lost to Wisconsin in the first round of the NCAA tournament that essentially ended Roy Williams' career. Mm-hmm. Last year, frankly, had a pretty bad two th- first two thirds of the season before that run to the national championship game, and then this year. Another not great year for the Tar Heels. What are, you, what are you seeing about what's going on with Hubert Davis's team? Well, first of all, it's unfortunate that the loss to Virginia kind of comes without a fully healthy Armando Baycott. I think you'd like to have seen what this team could have done in, in an opportunity where they had their whole group with them, you know, at full strength. But yeah, this has been a really kind of, it's reframing how a lot of people are looking at North Carolina because they came in with these high expectations and they, you know, they didn't meet those expectations throughout the regular season. And like you talked about, fairly early on in the regular season, it was clear that they weren't meeting those expectations. They dropped out of the top 25 earlier than, than we're used to seeing top top number one teams do. But 
it's clear that that run that they went on really kind of catapulted this program in a way that when you look at everything they've done outside of that stretch of games where they went, you know, all the way to the national championship game and no discredit for going all the way to the national championship game. That's very, very difficult to do. Uh, But when you remove everything else that has happened over the last really two years, but you know, last season and certainly this season, you're kind of looking at a middling power five team. I mean, that's kind of where they're at. They're they're a They were a bubble team last year until they made that run. And then they of course, you know, went to the national championship game. They've been a bubble team for a large chunk of this season. And now they're, they're NIT bound if they choose to go that direction, which <laughs> we don't even know if they're going to choose to, to play in that game. And I think returning four starters and having the situation develop the way that it did this year, you know, it's too early to make any sweeping generalizations about coach Hubert Davis. I'm not going to do that. Okay. I suspect you're not going to do that. He's a young coach. He's recruited very well. I think this program has a lot of talent, but there were issues this season and some of them you could point to potentially being coaching things that he needs to learn and, and, and get better about all younger coaches or uh, need to do that. That's not, you know, exclusive to him, but the, the match, the replacing Brady Manek with Nance didn't work. Uh, and you couldn't have foreseen that kind of going as, as poorly as it did just in terms of the relationship between Baycott and Nance, especially on the defensive end of the floor, the guard play was suspect throughout the year. And I think now you're looking at a team where, they're potentially going to lose a whole lot of talent and they're going to have to rebuild through the transfer portal. They're going to have to hope that some of the freshmen coming in and the, again, Davis has recruited very well. You could hope that those guys come in and kind of help turn this program around. But right now, like they're not in a good spot. And it, when you, when you remove that, you know, when you remove March of last year, uh, it gets even more dicey to look at where, where the Tar Heels are. And this is a very proud program, obviously a, the truest blue blood out there, at least one of the truest blue bloods that's out there. So I'm sure that they're going to rebound and they're going to figure this out. But uh, this was a, a rough end to what's been a rough season in Chapel Hill. North Carolina is going to have to take a look, a hard look in the mirror this off season. Um, I would even suggest they employ what coach Dean Smith, the legendary coach Dean Smith said that you do with mistakes, which is what this season has been. You mm-hmm. recognize it, you admit it, you mm-hmm. learn from it and you move on. And yeah. that's what North Carolina has to do this off season. Andy, we had some other losers mm-hmm. on the bubble around the country yesterday on Thursday. Uh, another I don't know if we'd call them blue blood. Ooh, that's an interesting conversation. But Michigan, <laughs> the Wolverines um, kind of have a same trajectory this season as North Carolina as a pretty perennial uh, bubble or not perennial, but bubble mm-hmm. team throughout this season lost to mm-hmm. Rutgers 62 to yeah. 50 on Thursday. They are the last team in the next four out. So they're at this point, uh, at least we're, and by the way, we're using Joe Lenardi's bracketology mm-hmm. as we talk about this. So they're in worse shape than North Carolina is as uh, mm-hmm. as a bubble team. And Andy, here's what you cannot do if you're trying to stay on the bubble. In in 18 minutes and 30 seconds of the second half yesterday, at least the first 18 minutes and 30 seconds, mm-hmm. Michigan was one of 17 from the field. Yeah. I don't know about you, Andy, mm-hmm. but anytime I've watched college basketball, here's something I've learned. If you would like to win a basketball game, <laughs> it's in your better interest if you have balls that go through the net. Uh, I, I don't know, bit. but that <laughs> seems like a foundational tenet to this game. So uh, um, Juwan Howard going to have to uh, figure things out and and looking like an NIT bid for them as well. Yeah, Michigan was my dark horse pick to win this conference. Uh, I thought they have a really, really talented squad with Jet Howard, of course, with Hunter Dickinson, uh, Kobe Bufkin. And yeah, uh, coaching decisions were a bit questionable in this game. Uh, the shots just were not falling. And again, it's, it's somewhat similar to Wisconsin. I think Michigan had a better resume throughout the season for the most part. Re- Wisconsin being on the bubble for as long as they were was quite honestly a little bit baffling to me. <laughs> um, Michigan, I thought I understood why they were on the bubble. I thought there was a, there was a, a pretty decent opportunity for them. Uh, they would have been among the bubble teams kind of heading into champ week. They would have been one of the teams I would have been more confident is actually going to make the NCAA tournament, but not anymore. Uh, it's another opportunity opportunity for a a well-established program again borderline blue blood uh to have gotten an opportunity to make the tournament all you need to do is win games like the bubble is weak this year we've talked about that a handful of times and there's we're going to talk in the second segment more about uh, teams that help themselves but the spoiler alert those are teams that won and they didn't even have to beat good teams you just have to not lose and you see it with with teams like michigan here losing games that they i mean records is a decent team but you have to win this if you want to make it into the big dance And, and we're seeing so many teams falling and and putting up 
not very good performances in their fun, kind of limp into the finish line and, and, and hurting their rebel chances significantly. And that's what happened with Michigan here. And here's then also, the truth. go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, here's the truth. Mm-hmm. The bubble is weak every year. Yeah. And so true. why on earth are we ever talking about expanding this tournament? <laughs> it is great where it's at. The bubble mm-hmm. is weak year after year after year. Do not expand the bubble. Do not expand this tournament. It's where it needs to be. I'm sorry, Andy. Go ahead with what you were saying. I was going to talk about the next game here on our on our list, which is Nevada, another team that just needed to win. You know, they didn't need to necessarily win the Mountain West Championship. I think if San Diego State won that and Nevada had a good run, uh, you know, we're going to see Utah State and Boise State play here uh, on Friday as well. But Nevada had an opportunity. They needed to beat San Jose State. San Jose State, uh, historically one of the worst Mountain West uh, basketball programs of all time. But – we got to give a shout out to Tim Miles, the coach over at San Jose State. They went 10 and 8 this year. This is the first time, I believe, in a very long time that they had a winning record in the Mountain West Conference. This victory over Nevada was their first Mountain West tournament win ever, and it officially ends the Wolfpack's chances of making the NCAA tournament. I think they were a very borderline uh, bubble line team, uh, bubble team as well. <laughs> Going into that, they kind of struggled towards the end of the year. Uh, and I think the Mountain West. They're, they're less lenient with them when, in terms of finding a spot for them on the bubble. I, I, and I'm quite honestly not sure Nevada d- deserves it, especially after losing to San Jose State. That's right. Great to see for Tim Miles, who mm-hmm. uh, may be finding a new place after yes. uh, his tenure at Nebraska there. So good luck to them. Mm-hmm. And then Oklahoma State, uh, they, they've been super bubbly. They did what they needed to do against mm-hmm. Oklahoma on Wednesday, but mm-hmm. just didn't have anything for Texas on Thursday, losing 61 to 47. Uh, they fall into the first four out. They're at the top of that list, though. So if there are no bid thieves and some other teams take losses, Oklahoma State could move back up. But now, since they lost, can't mm-hmm. do anything to help themselves. Well, Isaac, it's easy to focus on the teams that are costing themselves chances on the bubbles, but... There are some teams that did themselves a favor by winning games this week. We're going to talk about that after a word from today's sponsor, FanDuel. The midway point of the NBA season is here, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores and threes drained. Maybe you like the ridiculous performance that DeMontis Sabonis has put up for the Sacramento Kings. You want to keep betting on him this week? I get it. He has been on fire. Plus... FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same-game parlay. So don't miss the chance to get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right, Isaac, we got to talk about some of these teams that actually pulled off victories here and helped their chances of being on the bubble. It's always more fun and more engaging to talk about the teams that are hurting their bubble chances. Maybe not as much fun for the fans of said teams. So sorry for that, for those of you out there who are North Carolina, Michigan, Nevada fans. Uh, but there were some teams that did themselves some favors this week. And I think we'll start out talking about Penn State. Uh, Penn State has moved up and kind of continued to help their resume with a win over Illinois in the Big Ten tournament. They are now up into those last four buys. They have three straight wins, Isaac, by a combined seven points. <laughs> Cardiac Lions going on over uh, at Penn State. They didn't need a buzzer beater uh, in this victory here over Illinois, but still a very, very close victory for them. Uh, their next game is Northwestern. I think that's going to be a really interesting game uh, in the Big Ten. Northwestern, obviously the favored team there, the number two seed. Northwestern hasn't gotten a lot of respect as a legitimate candidate to win the Big Ten, despite being the two seed. Uh, I think there's upset potential here for Penn State. I think if Penn State plays a close game and loses to Northwestern, uh, I think there's still a pretty good opportunity that they'll make the tournament just because of how weak the bubble is and because Penn State has been on a a hot streak lately. Uh, That game is at 630 Eastern time on Friday on the Big Ten Network. It is the quarterfinal of the Big Ten tournament. Yes, indeed, man. There's a whole host of these teams. We move from Penn State to the Pac-12, where I thought Arizona State might have been the perhaps the biggest winner yeah, of Thursday. I would agree. Um, I, I personally 
didn't I, I honestly I thought USC was going to win this game mm -hmm. and I thought Arizona State was going to be on the outside looking in but mm -hmm. boy the Sun Devils did themselves uh, a big time favor 77 to 72 winning over USC and I don't think this does anything to the Trojans I think they are pretty safe and secure like they're not even in Lunardi's bubble watch currently mm -hmm. and so I, I think they should feel safe but Arizona State moves up into that last four in. Now, they are the last team in currently. They'd be shipped off to Dayton. And so, man, Sun Devils are praying to whatever God the Sun Devils pray to uh, <laughs> that there will be no bid thieves because that would push them right back off the bubble. For Arizona State, though, if they want to really cement this thing, they got a big-time opportunity tonight at 1130 Eastern in the Pac-12 semifinals against Arizona. Time for the Sun Devils to go out and prove that they belong in the tournament. Yeah, Arizona State's interesting team. They're 60th right now in the net rankings. They have a they have a decent resume. They have a lot of wins, but they didn't play particularly well in the Pac-12. I don't think they need this win over Arizona, again, in part because the bubble has kind of crumbled around them. But I don't think that this is the strongest resume team that is out there. However, they beat Arizona recently. It's a rivalry game. Who knows? Perhaps they could pull that one off and make it a cemented case for an NCAA tournament bid. Great. Dickin on the West Coast going over to the Mountain West. Uh, we kind of teased this game already, but Utah State, they beat New Mexico to continue to advance in the Mountain West. They're going into the semifinal game against Boise State. That is going to be an extraordinarily fun game between two very, very bubbly Man. Very, very good teams in the Mountain West. Utah State is on the bubble right now. They are third on the last four in. They've kind of floated around the bubble, if I'm not mistaken, and I don't have a super close update on them right now, but they were trending towards being one of the highest rated net teams to not make the NCAA tournament, according to some bracketologists. Currently, they are 18th in the net. 18th. I don't know how you could possibly keep this team out of the NCAA okay. tournament 24 and seven. Yes. They're in a mid-major conference. It's the mountain West. So uh, it's, you know, it's not the summit league with apologies to the teams in the summit league. Like the mountain West is, a, is, you know, going to put three or four teams in the big dance. Most likely Utah state, I think absolutely deserves to be in that field. Uh, they make it crystal clear. If they beat Boise state, that game is at listed on ESPN at 1159 Eastern time. Uh, PM CBS Sports Network again the semifinal between Utah State and Leon Rice's Boise State team going to be a very very fun one Andy Clemson is a very interesting story to me they obliterated NC State on Thursday 80 to 54 in the ACC tournament quarterfinal now, NC State has been playing some really good basketball, has an incredibly dynamic backcourt with Traquavion Smith, Jarkel Joyner, DJ Burns is a load inside. But Clemson has been a bubble team for quite a while and a team that their resume has been beaten up and looked at and, and dismissed, frankly. But with this win, they've moved up to the first four out. They're right behind Oklahoma State, so the second team out. Again, it's proof that all you have to do if you're on the bubble is win and let everyone else crumble around you as you were just saying. Here's the thing for me. When I watch this Clemson team, and I've seen them quite a bit this season, the eye test, which I think still needs to matter some, tells me that this Clemson Tigers team is an NCAA tournament caliber team. They've got P.J. Hall. They've got Hunter Tyson. These dudes are legit. And a whole host of folks that come together for Brad Brownell, who began this season on the hot seat and is now turning into what I think for Clemson is an NCAA tournament team. I'm really interested to see what they do. And if they want to solidify it and really put things together, they've got Virginia tonight at 930 Eastern on ESPN2 in the ACC tournament semifinals. You win that game and you might have just moved up onto the right side of the bubble. Stayed on the West Coast over here. Isaac, I watched a lot of Oregon basketball this year. And I got to tell you, I didn't expect to be having a conversation on the Friday before Selection Sunday about this team as a potential bubble team because for large chunks of the year, they did not look like it. They really struggled early in the season. Five-star uber prospect Kalel Ware has been nothing short of a pretty tremendous disappointment for the Ducks. He's barely playing at all. He just They just announced the all Pac-12 freshman team with five players on the team, multiple honorable mentions. He did not make it despite being one of the highest rated prospects to come into the state of Oregon uh, and the Pac-12 conference. Uh, but now, after beating Washington State on Thursday, 75-70, to 70, 
they're at a legitimate chance to, to be in the bubble spot. Lenardi has them as the next four out right now, second on that list. They got UCLA at 9 p.m. Eastern time in the Pac-12 semifinal. That's a monstrous game. You beat UCLA. I think you end all doubt at that point. You're going to make it into the NCAA tournament. But here's the deal. Oregon is 2-8 and eight in quad one games this year. This has not been a strength for the Ducks. They do not play up well against high-level competition. They don't have any quad four losses. They have one quad three loss. They have four quad two losses, 44th in the net ranking. I don't love this team right now. I think we can acknowledge, as we have throughout the show, that most of the teams that are in this conversation have warts. That's why they're in this conversation. That's not why they're, that's why they're not squarely in the field already. Uh, Oregon's got a chance to make a significant noise if they beat UCLA, but their record in quad one games indicates that that might be a challenge for them in this one. Well, a team that is in that almost exact same boat as Oregon to me is Vanderbilt, who mm-hmm. frankly did not look good for the majority of this season. However, they won 77 to 68 over LSU on Thursday. Mm-hmm. They are now in the bubble part of the next four out they're third on that list but they have won nine of their last 10 including beating kentucky and tennessee but vandy's resume in terms of like net ranking and quad is very similar to oregon they are 82nd in the net andy and they have three losses combined in quads three and four but they are nine and ten combined in quads one and two with four quad one wins I don't think Vandy is close enough right now, but they have a big opportunity against Kentucky uh, tonight, 9 Eastern on uh, SEC Network in the quarterfinals. As as for Rutgers and Ohio State, Rutgers gets a big win. They'd been in a tailspin. They beat Michigan, as we talked about, and now they're the last four in. They want to keep moving up, and they have a chance to do that by knocking off Purdue starting this afternoon, noon Eastern on Big Ten Network. And so uh, Rutgers can really help their thing there. Now, Ohio State has won a couple games. I think it's too little too late for them, but they are a potential bid thief, Andy, if they could keep winning. And uh, I mean, they've got some enough talent to make some noise in the Big Ten. I just don't see them getting all the way to that championship game. But if they do, just keep an eye out. And those bubble teams are sweating uh, the Buckeyes potentially doing that. Well, Andy, we want to wrap up today's show by looking at a few teams that we might have dismissed that maybe we need to t- retake a look at because they are peaking at the exact right time heading into the NCAA tournament. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But first, today's episode is brought to you by Built Bar. Are you looking for a delicious treat, but you don't want all the fat and calories? Well, you got to try Built Bar. And if you're like me, man, I'm trying to look a little healthier this year. I turned 40 in less than a year, and man, I got to be in shape for that. And so if that's you, I got the right thing for you. It's Built Bar. With Built, why does it why is it so great? Well, part of it is because it's covered in 100% real chocolate, all these Built Bars. And they come in incredible flavors like churro or peanut butter brownie. And I'm not sure how Built does it, but these bars taste like candy bars while still maintaining great macros like just 130 calories or 4 grams of sugar and yet 17 grams of protein. And perhaps best of all, now you don't have to sit around and wait for an order to come from Built.com. You can just head down to your local Walmart or Sam's Club to get a box or a whole crate full to satisfy those big honking needs that you might have. So try Built Bar today. You won't be disappointed. They're a proud sponsor of the Locked On Network. Okay, Andy, I want to have a conversation about a couple teams that are really rounding into form at just the right time. But the biggest one I want to talk about is the Gonzaga Bulldogs, who I think some teams, some, some media pundits might have written off because they had those three losses earlier in the season, had that loss to LMU at home, which just isn't something that they typically would do. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think because of that, a lot of people are like, ah, this isn't one of those Gonzaga teams that's just going to blow everyone out and be elite. But outside of that and and a loss at St. Mary's in overtime in a game in which, quite frankly, Gonzaga led yeah. and, and looked the better team most of the way until Aiden Mahaney, Aiden mahaney mm-hmm. Gonzaga has been doing what we typically expect Gonzaga to do outside of that. They beat St. Mary's in the regular season finale and then dismantled (laughs) St. Mary's in the WCC final. I am not so sure that we should have written Gonzaga off for those who did. 
And I'd be really, really curious to see what's going to happen in the NCAA tournament because what a funny turn of events that would be <laughs> if out of nowhere, here come Mark Few's Bulldogs mm -hmm. and they grab at worst right now, they're going to be a three seed. They could yeah. slide into a two seed slot. And what if, what if this was the year? It's been an interesting season for Gonzaga for a lot of reasons. I think that the concept of, of them being written off too early, I'm not sure that that's exactly true. I think that the team adapted and grew and evolved in mm. ways that we haven't seen a lot of Mark Few teams do in the past. And, and I'll go back to the 2021 season with Jalen Suggs and the year that they kind of boat raced everybody until uh, Scott Drew and the Baylor Bears in the championship. And that team didn't grow throughout the year all that much because they didn't need to. That team destroyed Kansas on the first game of the season. Like that team was good from the get go. They beat Kansas, they beat Virginia, they beat Iowa right out of the shoot. It was an extraordinary season. Jalen Suggs was a truly prepared to play at this level freshman in a, in a level that you don't see all that often. High level programs occasionally don't even get guys like this every single year. For Gonzaga to land a guy who was that ready right away was unusual. And Mark Few, to his credit, had prepared that team by having them play a really tough non-conference schedule, and they just made it look easy. So I think for Gonzaga fans and for people who kind of more casually pay attention to Gonzaga, they were expecting that it's kind of always like that. And this year, Gonzaga loaded up their schedule. I mean, goodness gracious, did they load up their schedule. They had Michigan State, they had Texas, they had Kentucky, they had Purdue, they had Baylor, they had Xavier, all in the first three weeks of the season. That is insane to play. All. Then they played Alabama a few weeks later, just, you know, for fun. Like they had this insanely <laughs> difficult non-conference schedule. You had a sophomore point guard who played backup minutes to Andrew Nembhard last year. Spoiler alert, Andrew Nembhard played about 38 minutes a game last year. So your starting point guard is basically brand new. You have this whole new dynamic kind of taking place for the Zags and this tough schedule. And Mark Few kept telling us, he said all off season, he said coming into the year, the schedule is going to be really hard for us. We're not the same team that we've been in the past, and the WCC is significantly improved. And I don't think a lot of people listened to him, to be perfectly honest. I think that that's kind of what happened. So then when Gonzaga, I mean, frankly, Gonzaga rarely gets beat badly, and they did by Purdue, and they did by Texas, and those games being early in the season were very shocking. It's also worth pointing out, particularly in Purdue's case, they weren't the number one team in the country at the time. In fact, they were ranked 24th in the time when they beat Gonzaga by about 18 points uh, in Portland. And I think that seeing Purdue turn into the number one team in the country helped people realize, okay, maybe that was less about Gonzaga and more about Purdue. But I think that this team has started to come into their own. Their guards have matured and developed. They've been less reliant on Drew Timmy, more reliant on Julian Strother to kind of carry more of an offensive load away from the rim, put less pressure on Drew. Defensively, they have improved significantly. That's still a big issue for them. For them to win the, the NCAA tournament, they would become the worst defensive team in the Ken Palm era to win the national championship by a significant margin, significant, significant margin. So I think that that's worth acknowledging is that this team would have to tighten up defensively in a really tremendous way if they wanted to make a deep run. But after watching what they did to St. Mary's, after watching what they did the last few weeks of the season, anybody who is adamant that this team can't make that kind of run just hasn't been paying attention. They absolutely can. And... Andy, right now, on Ken Palm, you know who's got the number one rated offensive efficiency in the nation? I have a guess. <laughs> Tell me who your guess is. My guess is going to be the Gonzaga Bulldogs. That's right, it is. It is no longer Baylor. Gonzaga <laughs> is the number one rated offense at Ken Palm. Can that offense do enough to make up for the defense that's right now, I believe, ranked in the 70s at yeah. Ken Palm? That's what we're going to have to watch. Mm -hmm. But this offense is clicking and it is humming. And if if and when Gonzaga does eventually lose, if if they don't win the whole thing, I don't I don't know if you know that, Andy. There's only one team. Only one. <laughs> only one that gets to win on their last game outside of the other tournaments. If and when that happens, I do not want to hear the narrative of oh, Gonzaga is never going to do it. This team is going to break through sometime, and this mm -hmm. could be the year. Yep. All right, Andy, very quickly, because we got to get out of here, two other teams that we want to mention peaking perhaps at the right time. UConn. What a roller coaster of a season. They started the season unranked, climbed all the way to number two, dropped all the way back to 24, and now sneakily, sneakily, they are back to number 11 in the nation. And oh, by the way, in tonight's Big East semifinals, they are favored by three and a half at our FanDuel friends. Mm-hmm 
over Marquette, who's the number one seed in the Big East tournament. 6.30 tonight, Eastern time on FS1. Can UConn continue to do it? Oh, by the way, we had talked about Villanova as a dark horse. No, sir. They are out in a big way of the Big East tournament. And finally, the Duke Blue Devils. They're, they're kind of Kentuckying, if you'll allow me that phrase. They are back to 21st in the AP poll, which I think they are playing at a higher level than that right now. But they've de- done this thing that John Calipari teams often do, where they have just kind of worked to getting these freshmen all together, worked mm-hmm. to getting healthy. And boy, I would not want to be standing in the way of the Duke Blue Devils as we get into the NCAA tournament next week. Big time semifinal game tonight against Miami 7 on ESPN2. Frankly, that to me is the ACC final with all due respect to Clemson and Virginia. So these are three teams that I think we both believe are really finding their rhythm and their way at the right time. Uh, A question is like, Alabama going the other way, right? Can they regain the form mm. that they've had? We talked about that quite a bit this week. Well, Isaac, two days, two days. <laughs> we are talking selection Sunday. We're going to be looking at who is in, who is out, who's playing, who, where they are playing, all of that good stuff. I cannot tell you how excited I am about it. Locked on college basketball. We appreciate every single one of you who has tuned in, whether you tuned in starting in November when the show started, whether you're just now coming to us either way. We appreciate your listenership. Leave us a comment on YouTube. Leave us a review on iTunes. Subscribe on YouTube. We definitely appreciate every single person who has subscribed there. Uh, Just go to YouTube.com, search Locked On College Basketball, hit that subscribe button if you haven't done so yet. Uh, We got more content coming your way this month. Tons and tons of fantastic content as we get closer and closer to the NCAA tournament and, of course, the national champion, Isaac. I'm so excited. I know you're excited. Let's blow this thing up as we get into the big dance. All right, folks, until next week, peace out.